Hey, everyone. So what is Burning Man? Well, you ask a dozen people, I guarantee you're going to get at least 13 answers. Anybody here been? Any show of hands? Yeah, you, you all have your own answers. That's OK. Um, it's a rave. It's a pagan ritual. It's an art party. It's a transformational festival. Well, I, I respect everyone's opinion, because that's part of what Burning Man is all about. Um, if you ask me, though, as a, as a longtime organizer, you ask one of my colleagues, the f actually, the answer that's going to come out of our mouths is three letters, BRC, Black Rock City. Because that's what it is to us. That's what the majority of the work that we do is, is on creating this uh, crazy city in the middle of the desert. That's an aerial view uh, taken from this year of our little uh, hometown. It is for one week each year, the third largest metropolitan area in the state of Nevada. It's about uh, 125 miles north of Reno in North America's largest dry lake bed. Um, for you planning geeks, this is taken from the uh, side we call the uh, 9 o'clock side. The radial streets are laid out uh, according to the hours of a clock with uh, an intentional gap between 2 o'clock and 10 o'clock to let the natural world in, to give us a view of the mountains and of the art. Now, if you had told any of us 30 years ago that we would become a civic authority, that we would be operating a city in the desert, uh, the response would have been skeptical, to say the least. Burning Man was started in 1986. It was literally two guys and a hammer. They knocked together a, a wooden effigy. They dragged it down to a San Francisco beach. They set it on fire. Some of their friends showed up, and then more of their friends showed up. And they decided to do it the next year, and more of their friends showed up. By 1990, so many friends showed up that it had suddenly outgrown San Francisco. So they were forced to take it out into the wilderness and make their own city. This is another view of, uh, of our town. Uh, that pentagon shape is actually our city superimposed over downtown San Francisco. So you can sort of see the scale of it. It's about seven square miles. Uh, obviously not as hilly uh, as San Francisco, nor as populous. But uh, this year, our population was right around 70,000 people, which is uh, equivalent to other American cities of, say, uh, like Santa Fe, New Mexico, or Muncie, Indiana, or Passaic, New Jersey, of about that size. <clears throat> Just for uh, some proof points for any doubters, we do have all of the basic health and safety infrastructure you would expect of a city of that size. We have law enforcement. We have a fire department. We have emergency services, and we have a pretty decent little hospital. It's actually uh, on a par with what you'd expect to see in a state-of-the-art military field hospital with positive pressure system and all that to keep the dust out. We have uh, an airport, yeah, <laughs> 88NV on your civil aviation charts. We have uh, probably about a dozen radio stations. We've had a daily newspaper since 1992. We have a post office. We have a library. Actually, not a library. It's more like a souped-up hot rod bookmobile, but, it, but it's, a, it's a library. Public transportation system. Since 1997, Black Rock City has been automobile-free. Uh, participants are allowed to drive into their camp, and at the end of the week, they're allowed to pack up and drive home, but in between, not allowed to drive, making us probably the most bicycle-intensive city, uh, certainly, that I've ever encountered, more so even than, say, Davis, California, more so even than Amsterdam. Uh, these are a couple of thousand yellow bikes that we provide in addition to the tens of thousands that our participants bring up. The other component of our public transportation system are art cars. We registered about uh, 600 of these through our DMV. Yeah, we have a DMV, <laughs> the Department of Mutant Vehicles. And they range anywhere in size from, say, a, a two-person golf cart shaped like a cupcake to literally as big as a house. That one in the lower left there is the Never Was Hall out of Vallejo. That is a Victorian house sitting on top of a vintage uh, steam tractor. Um, so between those two, uh, that's, that's how people get around out in our town. Uh, highly interactive because of that, right? Nobody has to get out of their cars. They're already out of their cars. <clears throat> and after we leave, that's what Black Rock City looks like. Uh, we're one of the world's largest Leave No Trace events. Um, our event this year was uh, about a month ago. The last of our restoration crew are still out there picking up the last sequins and feathers and paper clips and the last little bits of ephemera so that we'll be able to leave it in the perfect pristine state that it was when we found it. Um, so that idea of being a pop-up city is actually both a challenge and, a, and actually a really rich opportunity. 
It's a challenge because it's a lot of work. It's a huge responsibility to have to clean up everything that came out there. And believe me, a lot of things come out there. But it's a rare opportunity in the sense that uh, unlike any other city I'm aware of, we have the luxury of being able to tear it all down and start over again in the next year, right? Which gives us a beautiful iterative development cycle, right? It basically turns us into a living laboratory for urban design and for placemaking and for social engineering, right? Um, to that end, we take that very seriously. We document extensively everything that happens in every department uh, in, a, in, in an enormous report we call the Afterburn Report. And with an eye always towards function over form, we take a look at those results and we keep the things that worked and the things that didn't work, we rework and come up with a new approach to it, right? So earlier in the century, back around 2003, 2004, our growing regional community, we have regional groups all over the world, they started clamoring for more information on how to build cities of their own. They wanted to recreate this in the other 50 weeks of the year closer to home. Interestingly, our founder, Larry Harvey, one of those two guys with the hammer, he, uh, instead of giving them a big set of plans and blueprints and, and uh, zoning regulations and building codes, he gave them more of a, of a philosophical map. Uh, it's a document called the, the Ten Principles. And this is more of kind of a, of a psychic blueprint for the values of the community. It's interesting to note that uh, this didn't come out of Larry's said. This was observational. This was after the community had been in place for many, many years. Um, so it's much more descriptive than proscriptive. It's not a big list of thou shalt's and thou shalt nots. It's just a description of the qualities of community that sort of add together to lead to these amazing, uh, uh, stunning results that we've had. I could spend an hour on this slide, and I'd love to. Uh, I don't have time, so I am going to just tell you simply that if you're interested more in the philosophical underpinnings, I urge you to go to burningman.org and check it out. You can read that document in its entirety. Since uh, I don't have much time with you, I wanted to focus more on sort of zoom out a little bit and get some of the larger lessons that we've learned from, from 30 years of doing this in the desert. The first of those is just the extraordinary power of interactive art, of public art to galvanize community. We spent about $1.5 million this year on art grants. And believe me, we did not do that to make the city look pretty. We do it, once again, function over form, because we found that art just works magic in terms of building community. It does this in, in a couple of important ways. Uh, first, for the participants, to encounter art that is inviting, uh, not forbidding, that is uh, accessible, not uh, self-referential, art that you can touch, art that you can very often climb on, art that sometimes you can even mechanically operate, creates this sense of joy and wonder. It's a sort of a playground effect, right? that bonds those people together with their experience with the art, that bonds them to the art, and through the art to the community. It's just a, a really super powerful community builder. Equally important, you don't build art like this working by yourself in a garret. It takes a huge crew to do this. So our artists over the years have been forced to organize and to create groups and communities of their own to create the art. One of, I think, our proudest achievements is a number of art crews that have come out of Burning Man and started their own nonprofits. Groups like Flux Foundation, like uh, the Flaming Lotus Girls, and maker spaces like Crucible, like American Steel, like the Generator in Reno, that really were at the vanguard of what we now call the maker movement, but which came up out of, out of the environment of Burning Man. Really quickly, here's another pretty notable piece of art from Burning Man. This is Big Rig Jig by Mike Ross. I popped this in here because uh, a few years ago, we did some consulting with uh, the Downtown Project in Las Vegas. Have you heard about them? They uh, recently acquired this piece uh, from Mike. Uh, it's going to go on installation and go, be installed in, in Vegas. As soon as it gets back from the UK, where it's currently on loan to the English artist Banksy, who decided he wanted to put that in his, uh, in his satirical theme park, Dismal Land. So after, that, <laughs> after he gets back, it will be visible in Vegas. <clears throat> OK, the second big meta lesson aggressively, relentlessly drive interactivity, put people together. We do this in a bunch of ways. We do it through high-density zoning. We do it through creating community plazas throughout the city. And this is our version of a downtown. This is our Center Camp Cafe. It's about 45,000 square foot shade structure, huge community hub, performance spaces, lectures, spoken word stage, and also, interestingly, one of the only places in our city where you can actually buy anything. Burning Man is a very non-commercial or decommodified event. Um, but when we were originally deciding what we liked about city life and what we wanted to carry over into the desert, 
Everybody liked a coffee shop, right? The power of the coffee shop as a community hub was something we definitely wanted to recreate, and that's still what's going on here. Another big aspect of our interactivity plan are what we call theme camps. This year we placed over 1,000 of them. These are all participant run, organized, and funded, and all based on the idea of creating some kind of a public space and offering some kind of a gift to strangers, to whoever shows up. It might be a meal, you might get a massage, you might get a cocktail. Uh, this is uh, Red Lightning Camp where you might get some yoga sessions, you might listen to a lecture series, and uh, I think actually probably one of the most stunning examples of the kind of temporary architecture that has sprung up in our town. Pretty, pretty beautiful to look at. Third big lesson, <clears throat> don't try to over-engineer. As much as we know about urban design, as much as we've learned over the years, we gotta leave space for the unexpected. <clears throat> One good example of that, the temple. When we were picking things we liked, like cafes, and things we didn't wanna bring out, like shopping centers, it never imagined, we never imagined that we would need a sacred space until in 2000, uh, artist David Best created the first of these temples. This is the most recent incarnation of that in, uh, from this year. Temple is a uh, space for contemplation, for recollection, and for remembrance. By the end of the week, the entire inside of the structure is filled with photos, mementos, notes to the departed, and then at the end of the week, it burns to the ground, and all those wishes go up in smoke. This concept is so powerful it has been exported. Last year, David built a temple in Londonderry in Northern Ireland, a town that could definitely use some healing after many generations of the Troubles. This uh, was a huge success. He put it in no man's land between Catholic and uh, Protestant neighborhoods. Uh, something like three quarters of the city's population showed up to pay their respects there before they burned that one down. Other tendrils out into the world. We've spun off a number of nonprofits over the years. BlackRock Solar has been installing solar arrays at no cost or low cost all over Nevada in schools and uh, community facilities on tribal lands and doing some good youth education. Uh, Burners Without Borders is our disaster relief arm. BlackRock Arts has been placing big public art in cities all over the world. And we're supported by this amazing global network. This is a map of all the burner groups all over the world, 33 countries. Uh, they do everything from food drives and beach cleanups to very ambitious projects modeled after our own. There are cities that are kind of this network of sister cities that are growing up. Places like Tonkwaru in South Africa, population about 12,000. Uh, the uh, Midburn in Israel and the Negev Desert, population about 7,000. And all over the world, people are starting to try to adapt this model. At different times of the year, though, because at the last week of August, this is where they want to be. <laughs> if they can get a ticket. Uh, I strongly advise you to come on out and figure it out for yourself. I can only tell you so much about Burning Man ultimately as a personal experience, and if you want to see it, you got to get in line to get a ticket. Come out and join me, and I promise we will uh, keep on burning it for you. Thanks very much.